All right, the sequel. I, uh, I think, um, oh man, uh, these intros don't get any easier, huh? There's a lot of pressure here to live up to what we did before, both for me and for them. It's hard enough making one video game, let alone two. Oof. There's a temptation to repeat success, to get back to another classic adventure with people we liked. People, however, tend to change. Things develop, it's the nature of stories. We want to see where things go next and push our favourite characters further. So, what's the best approach? Do we just beef up the cinematics and bust out some jank mocap? Do we move on completely? Show how everything has changed, maybe expressing that in the mechanics? Do we just get it wrong? A few games in, usually. <laughs> but there is one example that shows how to do it right. One that I think is very special, and one that I really, really want to do justice to. And uh, spoilers. It's dope! That's where we pick up in the second part of our Sly Cooper retrospective, where we explore the techniques used by the series to tell a great story. Part 1 was a look at how it all got started, discussing the gameplay and presentational choices that made it stand out, and the great potential it represented. In analysing the sequel, we'll be doing the same, with one key difference. This is about how that potential became reality. I hope you've got all that in mind. You do? Nice. We're ready to go. The next part of our journey is truly something. All told using perfected design tactics and killer presentation from a team at the top of their game. We take a look now at the definitive Sly Cooper experience. Sly 2, Band of Thieves. You can run with us. Sly 1's success was strong, but slow. A lot of this was down to competition. 2001 to 2002 had loads of next-gen sequels come out to play, as well as the debut of newcomers Ratchet and Jack, both born from well-established companies. Their sales outpaced Sly by quite a distance, but it wasn't overlooked completely, far from it. Sly instead was getting attention from the press, featured all over print media with high praise for its aesthetics, and winning Best New Character for Sly Cooper himself at GDC in 2003. Sony had a lot of visible confidence in this new property, and gave it plenty of support, enough for Sucker Punch to begin work on an exciting new project, a sequel of their own. As proud as they were of Game 1, Sucker Punch were open about many of its flaws. First was structure. While they had worked hard to tell a strong story through the design, it relied heavily on traditional video game formats, involving linear levels, arbitrary life systems, and tenuously related minigames. It was holding them back. A few pointers came from focus testing. They found players would often attempt to, because they could, wander far off the beaten path, and many mentioned, even in reviews, that the game felt too restricted or insubstantial in content. Resultantly, depth and choice, in designer Rob McDaniel words were to be given more consideration. Secondly, there were likeable supporting characters, but they felt like formalities rather than essential parts of the experience, only appearing in tutorials or minigames. We were told this was a group of thieves when the only real thieving was done by Sly as the others cheered him on, when not comically fainting or trying to blow their nose again. Achoo! I'm very appealing, I promise! The possibility was considered to give them the same kind of interactive opportunities and to see what that did for the narrative and gameplay. The final issue was that it hadn't been completely fine-tuned in its stylistic identity. The music was a little eclectic, the art style sometimes felt muddled, just a few elements seemed to be working against the overall vision. Yet, by this point, Sucker Punch was no longer just a start-up bunch of associates. The company was getting serious support, and therefore more serious with its production roles, often having different department leads in the same room. This streamlined communication so that it was much easier for the team to share ideas and commit to a stronger collective vision. It's in this environment that the seed for a sequel was born, a one-sentence pitch. Sly and the gang work together to pull off a string of big heists. It came back around to the question that shaped the first game. What makes you feel like a thief, or more specifically in this case, a gang of thieves? Instead of following a dictated path to eventually face a boss, what lets the player feel like they're in the act of outsmarting their enemies? How does the team function outside of tutorials? How do the characters drive the story? And how does that change where the gameplay takes the player? It was time to collect some more inspiration, but not, this time, from just cartoons. You think we need one more? All right, we'll get one more. They went back and watched films like The Italian Job and Ocean's Eleven to get a better sense of tonality, their environments, the interplay between the actors, the narrative beats they created to build to a heist that the audience was emotionally involved in, as well as the juxtapositional atmosphere they captured, the trappings of high society blended with morally dubious characters. 
Refocusing their concept meant Sly needed to inhabit a very different world technically. They now knew what to prioritize within the limitations of the PS2, so the entire engine of the original was pulled apart and recreated, largely by Chris Zimmerman, to condense old technology and offer more technical space for the programmers and artists. Work was intense on creating a Jungle Gym-inspired interactive playground, mostly poured into a test stage based in Monaco that eventually would be scrapped, but still helped to the formation of the final game enormously. I made it into the game spiritually. Yes, spiritually. I mean, you can tell, it's, it's like a big, uh, impressive, kind of Riviera feel, high class, very yeah. Sly, Sly Cooper very style. Cool. Yeah, just figuring out the evolution of the gameplay between Sly 1 and Sly 2. Getting that to work was the signal of a strong and brave new direction that would develop the storytelling possible for these characters. We actually got our first glimpse of this shift in a comic that was published to promote the series, a good example of the development between the two games. It's a one-shot that reintroduces us to the characters and demonstrates the life Sly's been living since the first adventure. This fleshed out some of the cast and offered up some backstory. It includes a cutesy first heist origin at the orphanage highlighting the trio's bond, the first glimpse at a villain of a different stripe to the original game's bosses, and of course, the ongoing banter between Sly and Carmelita. Carmelita, you know I only steal from master thieves. I never take anything from the hard-working citizen types you love so well. So when you think about it, we're kind of on the same team. Don't get me started. Where do you think those thieves get their loot from, huh? They steal it! So I don't care where you think you sit on the food chain. You're still breaking the law. She's obsessed with me. He's obsessed with me. The most striking thing about the comic is how much of the material was developed in-house by members of Sucker Punch, and Sly being integrated into comic book form feels very validating given its roots. A newfound confidence in the idea had taken root, well-formed characters starting to suggest all these new story possibilities. This was now a seriously investable brand. It was even more evident in 2004 when they finally managed to sell 1 million copies after releasing a Greatest Hits edition, something Sony was all too happy to promote. They really pushed the boat out in marketing the next game, releasing a ton of promotional material, some of it welcome and some, uh, yeah. That dick rap is not raccoon. Leave it, yeah. All that remained was to see, once it was released, if Sly 2 could really deliver on all this promise. Long story short. Yeah, of course it did. Uh, let's start again, actually. Uh, compose myself a bit here. I want you to think of this as a small three-act piece, using different rhythms of level layout and character action to create drama. The goal is to both grab the attentions of new players and set up for returning fans just how much of a leap this is going to be from the first game, because it is, in many ways, a microcosm of the whole experience from this point on. Right from the opening seconds, there's a more maturely restrained approach compared to the original. The music is softer and more coherent in its style, the staging clearer, the genre playfulness stronger. You press start, and the story begins. Breaker Alpha Foxtrot, this is the wizard. Do you read me, Sitting Duck? This is Peking Duck. I hear you, Blizzard. No, Sly, I'm the wizard, and you're Sitting Duck. I read you loud and clear, Lizard. No, I, I'm... Forget it, you're not taking this seriously. Yeah, I'm not. Look, Bentley, I know this is your first time out in the field, but you've gotta loosen up. If we're going to get to those clockwork parts, I need you on your toes. So in plain talk, what's your status? Great first impression. Establishing dialogue now also illustrates interpersonal relationships between the beats. It's expanded in the same way as the now noticeably big area you start in. You're free to stretch your legs in this space, the correct path requiring you to move upwards rather than forwards, easing the player into the gameplay's athletic vocabulary. <laughs> Okay, okay, let me at that security computer! Bentley is introduced as a field character right away, and we get to watch him work, setting expectations for the gang's new involvement. The whole thief thing, it's very strong here. Unlike Sly 1's empty police headquarters, this is a public environment with guards visibly walking up and down corridors, the delicate tension that things could go wrong set after hearing Bentley's less than competent distraction. Uh, attention all guards! This is the network! Thank you. 
you're released from the closed interior to a wider, still bustling world, as if Sly is pulling off a heist right under the noses of the general public. It's all great stuff, though of course no sign of Mar- Carefully you make fun of in high school. So much has changed, and while we don't know how far that goes yet, it's great to see that Murray now has much more direct interplay with Sly the same way Benchley did in the original. Even for newcomers, he's on view as a wild card. Another barrier stands before you. Fear not, I shall bend it like the truth. <laughs> That's loud, maybe we'll get away with this after all. But then we cross from this open space to a closed room. It's clear something is off. I don't get it, Sly. The clockwork part should be here. This is all wrong. We need to pull the plug on this operation right now. Freeze, Cooper. Nice entrance, Miss Fox. Much more deliberated than last time when she jumped out of nowhere after probably T-posing in another dimension off screen. Ugh. Here, it's more like she was hiding and bam, gotcha. She actually caught Sly, sets her up as a believable threat, and she loses him not because she's bad at her job, but because of an unexpected new figure distracting her and us with questions about the current status quo. The method of entry and guard casualties all point to this being a claw gang job. Sly Cooper is right here. I caught him red-handed. I'm just saying that there are other criminals in the world other than Sly Cooper! After him! And then... Oh jeez! Wait up, Sly! Shake a leg, Murray. It's time to go. This wasn't part of the plan! Carmelita on your tail, the gang at your side. This is the moment it all becomes clear. Three lads running from the law and with you at the wheel, no less, to run along with them. You're an active part of a greater unit. A band of thieves. No, wait, come back. I didn't say anything wrong. You're all going to jail. Pick me up at the rendezvous. The desperation of escape is conveyed spatially, chaos framed below you as you zip across the wide open rooftops, attempting to coordinate with the van, then zigzagging through narrowing points to safety. I'll find you, Cooper! The tension abated, the curtain coming down, we're rewarded with our first 2D cutscene. Carmelita's just as angry as ever. She's really quite lovely when she's angry. The game's story is finally revealed. Well, actually, we go on better. We discover what was really going on in the previous adventure. Clockwork. He was consumed with jealousy for the Cooper clan's thieving reputation. Is it inappropriate to refer to him as a monster? No, not at all. That's a very specific description. Sly wastes no words, along with the violent imagery and sound effects, to show Clockwork as something inhuman. Imagine the hatred fueling that first decision to replace his mortal body with soulless machinery. Ultimately, it did the trick. Clockwork lived on. This is an extremely personal, somber opening. None of the showmanship of the first intro, and the informal voice progresses the theme of reputation, hearing the impact of characters on Sly and his world firsthand. It's going to colour the change in framing for the rest of the game, if not the series. The mission is more than clear as the prologue ends, as is the sense of dread. I don't know what's in my future, but I won't let it be a repeat of my past. Take a sigh, everyone. We're finally here, in Paris. City of culture, sophistication, rats. Its pedigree as a place of elegance has always made it an ideal setting for thieves, and the conflict that presents. The undesirable meeting the unattainable. So it's a no-brainer to make it Sly's home. The developers knew that players wanted to explore it properly after it showed up in the first game's prologue, and fulfilling that hope as level 1 makes for a nice button of relief after the intense intro. With the style finally nailed, now is certainly the perfect time to get back in action. In Sly 1, you were a rookie. The jobs were down and dirty, a pure revenge tale you'd been brooding on for years, hunting down other other criminal rejects hidden from the public eye. Two years on, and you're now out in the open, working against criminals who've managed to worm their way into high society. I think this pitches the series concept with a little more strength, seeing Sly, an obvious looking thief, now clambering around the polished streets of Gay Paris to mess with the rich and influential. This is reflected in most of the worlds coming up, all grand in one way or another, either based in scenic natural beauty or rich in a history of affluence. Sly has retained most of the moves we learnt in his first outing. The circle button is still the all-purpose method 
method to interact with stuff. Most of the extra abilities you had to earn now either a natural part of your moveset or simply dropped. The restrained choices reflecting Sly's more experienced understanding of thievery. It is the space he inhabits this time that has really changed the feel of the game. Before it was a series of obstacle courses, using your abilities at set points. Now the action takes place almost entirely in hub worlds with a few branching paths. The interactive elements dotted across the maps to form suggested routes. Jungle Gym is the term used by the devs to describe their new levels, and I think it's absolutely appropriate. You can sneak, jump onto, into, and over most of what you see. Even squeezing into vents and under furniture is possible now. You even get to go up the poopy sewer. Look at that mate, he's into it. You have more freedom to find out what Sly's capable of. So many of these hubs make great use of their rooftops, and the camera still intuitively works with players to let them use these as a natural vantage point. No path you take across a level is the same. The player has to think on their feet and improvise in the same way you'd expect him to. The abilities you're granted later on are all in service of exploration, the best new addition being the hang glider that allows you to cover great distances. It's also worth noting the subtle ways the base controls have been altered, and what that says about this new setup. Sly's natural movement is now a sneak. Running has been mapped to a shoulder button, a minor separation that emphasises when you have to reach for it, something's gone wrong. I had mentioned in Sly 1 that, when hiding inside of a barrel, a sound accompanied your tiptoeing to add some humour. What I hadn't mentioned was that this also occurred close behind guards, because it didn't matter. It was a neat trick. The sound would let you know if you were in their range of vision, in case they suddenly turned around. But as they instantly killed you, you tended to avoid them or just quickly lash out, avoiding this trick entirely. One new move has made it more noticeable, and way more fun. Sly can now follow and pickpocket guards, whether it be part of the mission or simply because you feel like you need a little extra cash. Ooh, that's Christmas sorted. It's a technique that requires a little timing and patience or the player faces real consequences. See, they've added a life bar, called a thief meter, replacing one hit kills. This means when you're discovered, you're not screwed in the long term, you've got some endurance options to help escape, but your momentary cover's totally blown. It's a chance to see the new and improved guards doggedly following you round the streets until you can shake them. You can choose to stay and fight, but it's not encouraged. McDaniel explained that they were designed to replace the soap bubble theory behind the previous guards. One pop and they're gone. Big guards carry stronger weapons and are much harder to kill, while smaller guards call for backup, or will actually follow you onto rooftops and carry their crappy attitudes with them. Oh, and you brought all your friends, what a thoughtful gift! You don't always get this opportunity either. In certain missions, you're not allowed to fail, to stress the importance of getting the job done right. I love the little abrupt stinger that comes with the fail state too. Guess what you fucked up? Guards can be taken out in these situations with stealth kills, but if another guard is nearby, they might hear the sound and come to investigate. This can work to your advantage. Ambient noise can now alert enemies and sometimes needs to be employed to distract them. You can line them up and position them where you want. The PS2 version was even usable with a voice-to-game headset that the player could use to recreate this effect themselves. The game dares you to try more underhanded activities like this, including the option to steal valuables you happen to find on the street, only keeping it if you can avoid the guards on your way back to the hideout. You can't really escape them. Every stage is crawling with these guys. The deck is stacked against Sly, which makes overcoming those odds, often hopefully unnoticed, even more satisfying. It's these tricky methods, these duck and cover tactics, that have turned the gameplay into an opportunity to really know Sly Cooper as a character. In the face of all this danger, Sly swaggers past with ease, which is kind of inspiring, but can make him come off, perhaps, as a smug git. Crime? I haven't stolen anything. Yet. No longer a naive kid trying to be intimidating, he's grown into a much sassier, self-satisfied person, able to get away with just about anything, even sneaking some sarcasm by his friends. Don't forget about me! You... did a great job opening that door, Murray. Thanks! He continues last game's trend of philosophizing to his enemies too, which now borders occasionally on patronizing. I feel sorry for you. All your education and you still don't know right from wrong. All this because you can't fly. You're pathetic. I have no idea what you're saying. And your suit sucks. No! But why wouldn't he? Sly knows what he can do, and employs much more of his talents appropriately so we know it too. I think one mission encapsulates his duality brilliantly, where you have to infiltrate a swanky ball. One minute you're creeping around a hotel, rustling through the wardrobe, scrounging for bits of a tux like a stinky hobo, and next you're out on the dance floor, charming the unsuspecting public and the law. It's interactive moments like this that show us more facets of his personality. Suave, perceptive, sophisticated, arrogant. Are you in law enforcement? I often deal with police while on the job. Sly 2's very good at picking at that flaw. Carmelita, after her intro, makes less antagonistic appearances, a contrast from the previous game where she had designated levels to chase Sly. Instead, he finds himself in the company of the much more amenable Neela, the good cop to Fox's bad, who shows up for an inverse of these sections. 
Sly must chase her. Don't fall behind. You can see as you run across the environment that Neela is just as good as Sly, able to go where he can in a level as well as having the same running speed. Subtle nods that the two are potentially compatible. Uh, still, compared to just how tough we had it with Carmelita, maybe this is too easy. I happen to have obtained the key to his back door, which a person like yourself can use however he pleases. Oh, <laughs> we are absolutely going to work well together. Maybe, uh, just maybe. We're getting a little carried away. Eh, it's okay, I, we, I guess we all get a little distracted. I'm sure this won't backfire horribly, no. You aren't by any chance here to turn yourself in. Old Ironsides would fall out of her dress. As good as that sounds. The story is very much about this lack of foresight, about Sly getting caught up in his own ego for all of his good intentions. That dragged over a game could seem grating, which is why he's helped along with the biggest new change. He is no longer alone out there. Behold the majesty of gravity and inertia! That was real subtle, Bentley. Sly's two friends, Bentley and Murray, now take an active role in the field and are fully playable. Like Sly, their gameplay choices reflect their characters, and what's really impressive is how they complement each other in personality, visuals, and control. Bentley's role as the brains is no longer restricted to just offering advice. He now leads the gang's heists as a master planner, every mission being part of his grand schemes. This means that occasionally he has to enter the breach himself to pull off a job, and, true to turtle form, is heavily armoured, relying mostly on sedating enemies to get around unseen. He also compensates for this as the team demolition expert, armed with multi-purpose bombs and favouring run and gun tactics. This makes him seem incredibly fragile, therefore less likely to be taken out onto the field unless absolutely necessary. What's with taking out the disco ball? Its impact will shake the nightclub's front peacock side loose from its morning. Look, I can't talk now, I've gotta keep moving, keep safe! Murray's change is the most radical, but totally in character. Sly made a comment last time that suggests Murray has at last found confidence in himself after being thrown into so many dangerous situations. That gave him the courage to become a luchador-style crusader, calling himself The Murray. He's gone from the hands-off burden of the group to the gamebreaker, something Nate Fox explained was a natural leap towards how players wanted to handle the extra weight they suddenly gained. Uh, so to speak. Sly can adapt to environments well, but he's not built for long-term confrontations with enemies. Murray, on the other hand, cuts through them like butter. He's the player's outlet for when they get frustrated with sneaking, and has very little problem dealing with anything that gets in his way, even turning enemies into projectiles. He can actually try sneaking as well, adorably in character. Of course, not being someone who does anything by halves, he's full tilt in the opposite direction of his former self to please Sly, his idol, overcompensating for his cowardice. That builds nicely on what we already know of Murray, and why I'm glad Chris Murphy stayed on to develop this new take, something that nearly didn't happen. I think they actually tried to recast uh, me. They sure did. Uh, for, for the second one. But from what I heard, it's just people would either couldn't get that loud and raspy or would just refuse to straight out. They'd be like, no, yeah. I'm not going to do that. I actually, <laughs> I did a session with the guy that, the, that got the gig to replace you, and he was so frustrated because he knew he wasn't giving them what they, they wanted. wanted yeah. And he was kind of taking it out on me in the session where, like, we'd be bouncing lines back and forth, and they didn't tell me to lead him in. Like, Kevin, can you give him that line? So I'm just waiting. For, I'm letting him do his thing. And he, like, kind of looks at me. He's like, are you, are you not going to work with me here? <laughs> I'm like, uh, I'm the levels are built to accommodate all three right down to a new base of operations in each world, the safe house. This acts as both the character select screen between missions and the place where you can use stolen money to purchase upgrades and weird gadgets. I do mean weird, by the way. Very weird. It's up to the player, once a mission is over, to travel back there on foot, so it has a physical presence in the game world too. You get to see your boys hanging together, all eager to start the next mission, or just thinking real hard. Their new dynamic underlines their codependence. Each has at least one major benefit the other does not, and one major drawback that stops them from being as useful as another. It's a fantastic way of communicating the relationship between characters inside of the game's design, making their individual strengths and weaknesses physically clear to the player. It's possible now for missions to involve more than a single character, with people tag-teaming to accomplish a task they cannot do alone, maybe even involving all three. Sometimes you'll tap in at a certain point in the mission only that character can complete to help them out, sometimes you're protecting your friend, or just working together to bust as many skulls as possible. They also employ other skills in the form of minigames. These have more credibility within the framing of the story than before, the length of the minigame dictated by the type of mechanic being explored. Is… is the helicopter your head? Ooh. It varies the tempo of operations to reflect the level of involvement in the narrative. A defensive mission would be a long, intense battle, while a sabotage would be several small build-ups to sharper, destructive payoffs. These are almost always performed by Bentley and Murray too, more willing to get their hands dirty than their frontman. Be a team player and take it out with that rusty pre-war turret. Okay, I had a potato gun once. 
I bet it works just the same. It's just as well they can joke with each other about it. Their chemistry helped along with the occasionally grouped performances of Kevin Miller, Matt Olson, and Chris Murphy. Improved budgets for the sequel gave them more instances to record together where possible. Yeah, I think the second and not. third was different. Yeah. We did some scenes together. We, we did feel, yeah. They, the started, they recorded that up in Seattle. Yeah, we changed studios when we went to Bad Animals in Seattle for the second and third games. And that's when they had multiple mics in the room and we started doing and stuff. And you could look at each other. Yeah, we did a little bit of that over at Webtone. I feel like you and I, Matt, were in the booth a few times. Each had some improv training, in particular Matt Olson. His friend, co-founder of Sucker Punch Brian Oberg, had been his fellow improv mate. And that gave them a great understanding to play off right away. It's the last vital ingredient to show players how close these people are. They're always swapping banter often picking at personal details, which gives you the impression that they're really paying attention to each other. My pleasure. You know how I love to mess around with Carmelita. Yeah, that's weird. It's an excellently balanced set of traits that lives up to the Band of Thieves name and lends it the structure of the films it took inspiration from. Small efforts and errands as you swap between gang members, different types of mechanics and gameplay styles built on the core principles that feel like tense, important contributions to the final plan. This builds anticipation for the player to want to see where it all leads, then escalating into operations that have the characters rapidly piggyback off each other to pull off a heist. The payoff is always sweet. Seeing the gang triumphant over a foe who thought they had it all figured out, and leaving everyone dazed and confused as you make a fast getaway. Who could have... what? Cooper! There is, of course, a trade-off. It's only natural that the door swings both ways here, as our heroes aren't the only ones making better use of their talents. You might be aware of something this game's heavier on. Character interaction. I mentioned previously that Nate Fox had become head writer, and he often spoke about interaction's importance when describing the sequel. It has been a challenge and a pleasure trying to make the story work with three interactive characters, because you're switching perspectives very often throughout the game, and it's not just the three gang members in the Cooper gang. And one of the more difficult things is trying to make sure that these characters all get screen time, or more importantly, uh, interactive time. So with all the characters, we work pretty hard to put them in positions which allow you to interactively experience who they are in their characters and uh, experience the character of the baddies. They don't just yell at you, they attack you in a method that reflects who they are as people. It's not just the script that Nate dealt with, however. Explaining his general role as a lead designer and its relation to story years later. I, uh, because, you know, I'm a designer, so I think about things generally from a mechanical standpoint like where would be a good time to have a heart to heart conversation <laughs> you know, in the midst of this gun battle right how, how long would it feel like a good idea to talk about our feelings in the midst of this gun battle i got a lot of feedback in that regard and then you know i either write the scene or another guy writes the scene Kind of split it up. Part of that is appropriately distributing these moments throughout the game. A huge amount of cutscenes have been added to help, a lot of them baked within missions to feed us substantial bits of information. Characters are no longer restricted to formulaic moments from the original thanks to these, especially the villains who we see collaborate to get their plans in motion. That fellow is very graceful. If only you moved spice shipments as well. Oh, silence. The masterminds are generally more fleshed out than before. There was plenty going on with the Fiendish Five in terms of design theory, but little opportunity to really show those characters off. Not the case this time. Not the case at all. <laughs> Dimitri is our introduction to the new way of doing things, and he's well remembered for a reason. First off, he's a solid visual pun, a lounge lizard, pulling on a little fear and loathing even. The thing that everyone remembers him for, though, is his, uh, colourful way of speaking. My soot is greasy sweet. It's important to note that this is a bit more than just writing down haha my fellow kids words. It's actually something he picked up from his childhood. English is a second language and he learned all his English from watching uh, hip hop videos. Have you no vision? Are you hearing what I mean to you? It's what gives him such a distinct flavour. He doesn't just speak in gags. His English is broken, so the syntax is horribly butchered with mistranslated placeholders. Smokey alert! Freak out! They don't let that overstay its welcome, though. As much as he's a figure of fun, it's made very clear he's running a successful operation in the public eye and should be taken seriously enough to consider a threat. This goes for all the villains down the line, contributing to the idea from the last game that they are similar outcasts to Sly, who dealt with that rejection negatively, and the tact it's now done with gives them a sympathetic edge that, truth be told, almost makes them seem more dangerous. Because you sort of get where they're coming from. I have to feel a little sorry for him. He's just a normal guy from the 1850s. Back in his day, he'd be a hero. But today, he's a villain. And while he goes to great lengths to convince others of his royalty, it's mostly to convince himself.
These people are not just boss battle fodder. In the original, colour palettes, design motifs, and loudspeaker announcements spoke for the control villains had over their environments. We still see that here, but in terms of layouts, it's more about setting moods from moment to moment. The Paris level, for example, uses Dimitri's colours for the nightclub interiors, but the main hub has a palette closer to Sly to reflect how adept he and his gang are in that environment. Perfect for a setup stage. Loudspeaker announcements now exist only via bugs we place in the villain's hideouts that we eavesdrop in on. More of a private joke to show our level of control. No, what sells the villain's dominance here is their presence on the field in person. We begin observing this through a new feature, reconnaissance work. Often at the start of a chapter, Sly has to sneak into the villain's base and take a few photos, picking up any other intel along the way. These are then drafted into the slideshows created by Bentley, making you visually feel like you're contributing to the pipeline of the heist. I plan to get at the clockwork wings requires the use of the electric winch above the ballroom. But it's not a case of simply pulling off the missions that follow. These villains aren't passive characters, no sir. These are masterminds with stakes in their operations, which is why some levels will have them come out of hiding and investigate. This requires the gang to assess the situation and occasionally get up close and personal. Any moment you're close to them, you kind of feel like you're pushing your luck, and the game loves to play with that idea. It gives the chapters a live feel, as if things are happening in real time, and you're watching their plans unfold right alongside yours. There's a larger margin of error in the narrative for things to go wrong, and no you were probably given at the start when Sly leapt in to discover the parts were missing. The first instance they cash in on this is when Rajan escapes at the end of chapter 2, meaning that in a series first, and last, certain locations are now spread over double chapters with two unique levels each. This example uses the level design to reflect the character's true nature. Rajan in power occupies a stage filled with regality and idealised city streets, while his actual hideout is, with the turn of his mood after being outed, an enormous, disorganised, crumbling mess. Rajan himself having gone bestial. It's indicative of the boss's reactivity. The characters drive the plot, not the other way around. It's a shame to say then that this is as good as the villains get. I'm sorry, I know, this is meant to be the best game, I said it was, but uh, you know, people really like this and I'm just trying to soften the blow because it just gets really Really bad, it all falls apart, it becomes really typical, sneak from the bad guy, fight the bad guy, win the game, BORING! After Rajan, we never really improve on these ideas, Jean Besson's just another big stupid enemy with a funny ad- Hey, excuse me, excuse me, I'm trying to- Can you not- Can you please- What? Wait, what? 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 Whoa, what? What? Leela had betrayed us, What? my teammates were captured, what? and I was all alone. Alright. Jailbreak isn't just the standout moment of the game, it's the standout moment of the series. A sneaky trick has been pulled on us here. We've been reacquainted with Sly's acrobatics and introduced to an extra level of power with Murray. Rarely are we told we have to play much as Bentley, and when we do, the tasks have always been as frantic and skittish as he approaches them. The cheekiest part is when, in one mission, he's hacking into the mainframe of Rajan's computer. Instead of playing as him, you're made to handle Sly and Murray in an attempt to fend off the guards. You see what the game is saying by doing this, right? Bentley is too weak, too vulnerable to handle this, and the player doesn't have to worry because they have two adequate alternatives at their constant disposal. Until, of course, they don't. We haven't just taken everything away from Bentley. We've taken everything away from the player. We're now forced to step up as him full time, in the most intimidating location of the game, no less. Yeah, it's no accident that Prague has been reinterpreted as a literal nightmare. Clockwork may keep Sly up at night, but collectively the gang is terrified of jail. And that's reflected in the design. It's a huge visual gag, the most exaggerated version of their greatest fear, to further make the point that this is not where you want to be. The prison locale offers a large amount of sharp, jagged points and grey hues, throwing in a blood-red sky to make the whole thing seem incredibly surreal. Just in case you didn't get the message about this being less than normal. Even some of our usual hiding spots are now part of a nasty surprise. Oh my god! Juxtapose this against the tiny and terrified Bentley, whose bright green colours stick out from the backdrop like a sore thumb, and you've got yourselves an excellent visual metaphor to overcome. Much like Haiti in the original, this world is placed slap bang in the centre of the story, the intense midway point after three fairly standard levels, so there's enough familiarity with how the game has felt so far to put you out of your depth. But what really ties this whole section together, what makes chapters 4 and 5 so compelling as its own saga, is the villain sitting at the centre of it all. She wasn't in the UK manual, you know, so uh, discovering she was a member of the Claw Gang back in the day was actually a big shock for me. I, I mean, they told me she was a cop, granted she's a big red spooky spider lady, but you know, uh, takes 
all sorts to make a world, right? The Contessa is essentially the antithesis of the gang. Rather than a group relying on teamwork, she's a lone authority who hurts anyone she comes into contact with for her own gain, magnified by her depiction as a black widow. Her webs and multiple limbs are sort of a metaphor for her interest in control and capture. The other villains in the game are all given sympathetic backstories. They came from nothing and worked hard to prove themselves, in misguided ways, as important people to be reckoned with. Not so for this lady. She had every opportunity to be a better person, and from what we've been told has used it purely to get ahead in life and keep others down mentally. It lends an irredeemable face to the oppressive atmosphere that you can work against, her reveal as a double agent playing both sides only adding to that frustration. The spools at Interpol. They keep sending me criminals and I keep making money. Bentley's reaction to this reveal, if you weren't on his side before, makes us love him now. Inconceivable! She's no healthcare professional! Why, that's the most heinous crime I've ever heard of! Putting inmates into hypnosis so they'll tell her where they've stashed their loot! It dishonors both law enforcement and thieves at the same time! The major aim of this level, though, is to show us, in the gameplay, why Bentley is pivotal to the team, first demonstrated by way of a refined tactic from the last time Bentley had to save his pals. Hacking. Ah, nothing like a good computer hack job. It takes on more of a neutral, streamlined approach graphically, probably because it's less of a cathartic victory than in its last appearance. What I like about these bits is that in each instance they teach a mechanic that's built on later, so they're less of a padded gimmick and more of, in their own way, an evolving story that you can learn and overcome. The music even gets faster and more frantic with each hacking mission you take on. <laughs> Making us like these characters and play as them has the added bonus of making us care when they're captured, wanting to see them free in order to play as them again. Sly's release is reasonably painless, and to emphasize the whole midpoint thing, we've got a great little throwback to the opening. You know the old saying, if you can't count on a friend to bust you out of jail, what kind of a friend are they? Truer words were never said. Wizard. Aww. Murray, on the other hand, is shown to be totally hemmed in and soon to be force fed drugs, sorry, spikes, to control his mood. I'm not making this up. Seeing the brawn of the gang get strung up like this is just sad, and it's the character's reaction that sells that. Oh, that looks bad. I've never seen Murray like this. He's all twitchy and bug eyed. It's neat that so much of this is alluded to beforehand, something the game takes great care to subtly weave into mission briefings and cutscenes, without being told outright that the Claw Gang's actions are all connected. The local spice plants are illegal for good reason. Eat too many, and you'll go into a fit of uncontrolled rage. Keep that stuff away from Murray. We see reams of unobtrusive foreshadowing and callbacks throughout, just to ensure there's enough dangling under our nose between missions to invest us in the wider story. Such a pity when an officer falls from the light. Yes, indeed. The dramatic irony of this framing? Too good. The mission conversations become a little looser, given the nature of the situation, and we get to see all three of them cast a little doubt, or just let off some steam. You gonna throw me in solitary? Contessa's role as a therapist underpins the psychological boundaries the gang are pushing against here as the walls tighten in on them. The stress, agitation, nervousness all plays out as they come to terms with the thing they always worried would happen, struggling through all that doubt to save their friends, even venturing into the belly of the prison to free Murray from his mind control and watching him go slowly insane. I'm a little teapot, short and stout. Tip me over and I'll smash up everything! Ah! We're put through an awful lot, which is why it's so good when they overcome the odds and are finally reunited. Who? What? Is this heaven? Sorry, pal. You're no angel. It's such a relief that the outro cutscene is devoted entirely to their reaction. They don't even talk about the story, they just celebrate the fact they're together again. Murray had to pull over twice because he was laughing so hard! I distinctly remember this being where I first saw the characters as real people. We'd been with them on this journey, we'd felt the tensions, experienced the grim atmosphere, and realized when the choices were taken away, we liked having them around. We'd followed them to hell and back. And the special part was that when we got to the end and reflected on our experience, so did they. I think something had changed. Since childhood, the three of us had never been apart. And our recent isolation gave us all pause for thought. This is the start of things really changing for the gang in terms of how we view their value. Connections have been made here that can't be broken, and things will never be the same again. Pretty masterful stuff. Murray let me drive. 
<laughs> the story continues on a much more cathartic level, and towards a pretty thrilling climax to the entire Contessa saga, as it were. Stuck between the vengeful Contessa and the traitorous Neela, backed fully by the law, the gang's mission becomes short-term revenge against the two in order to manipulate events and grab our prize, as well as help get Carmelita out of trouble. It's deliberately quite overwhelming in scale. The choice of real-life location Prague stems from the phenomenal architecture of the castles out there, a great excuse for designing enormous structures that emanate control, and it's even got an extensive history of creepy myths and legends regarding all kinds of ghosty woasties. Sneak inside and smash the coffin of the evil wolf priestess. Sounds pretty harsh. Does the old girl really deserve that sort of treatment? Weren't you listening? She was an evil wolf priestess. I like the reminder here that we're not playing as the good guy, by the way. It'll free all the ghosts trapped in there with her. Okay, I don't know where you're going with all of this, but freeing trapped ghosts sounds vaguely heroic. The stuff they got you doing here is mad, yo. Bashing up werewolves with traps, fighting tanks, busting ghosts to make you feel good. The missions are much more manic in tone to reflect a rising desperation with the almost nervous humor coming thick and fast. You wouldn't by chance know the security codes to the castle gates, hmm? Cross cuts between characters ramps up, certainly laying the path for intrigue concerning Neela's agenda. <laughs> Did I mention that you can drop ghosts down her chimney? Ho, ho, ho. It's an event that spirals into chaos over the final operation. The player bounced between characters and time frames in separate parts of the map as they tried to pull it all together back at the castle. These big set pieces and moving parts eventually funneled down to a chase for the clockwork eye. She got the eye? She's got the eye! Cutscene transitions help give plausibility to the events unfolding, character motivations always being the lead into a mission start. The payoff is strong here too. I think partly why the Contessa makes such an impact is in how she directly addresses Sly Cooper as a character, bringing the flaws suggested earlier to the surface and measuring that against her own values, the two playing off each other rather than talking at each other. You're an ignorant child playing dress up in his father's legacy. I have no interest in your narrow interpretation of morality. I'm above all that. Above good and evil. And you think I'd give the eye to someone that's above morality? It's all rather dizzying, but it goes to show that Sucker Punch really knew its stuff when it came to putting Sly 2 way ahead narratively of where it had begun. Everything's been turned inside out on us as we leave this stage, and rather than leaving with a sense of closure, we're simply even more curious to see exactly what's going on. This claw business was spiraling out of control, and I knew that my gang was at the center of it. We'd be back in action soon enough, but for now, well, we just laid low for a while. One thing I think Sly 2 absolutely nailed was its improved environments, especially noticeable once you get to Nunava Bay. It's a condensing of the Nunava region into a single bay area, based on the Inuit location in one of the coldest parts of Canada, isolated from the mainland and a good place to get away from the cops. Well, uh, most of them. Level design in the original took players on a linear ride through a sequence of events, so it was easier to hash out or suggest narrative beats when required. The question became, once they switched to open world, how to make that work in a static space? And the answer sprung from a real-life example. Disneyland uses a method of landmarking known as weenies. Don't laugh. A shorthand term for bits of architecture that serve as visual magnets. Mostly, this is so the guest knows where they are at any given time. The castle, for example, sits at the park centre, and is designed to be the first thing the guest sees once they enter, so they're mentally aware of a focal point they can orientate around. Different landmarks then let you know which part you've wandered off to or where you're closest to next. Sly uses the same principle to make naturally sprawling environments feel conquerable, especially useful as many non-American cities function on winding streets and huddled buildings rather than a numbered grid system. Landmarks need to be framed inside of environments from above and below, so you're not lost when you suddenly turn a street corner. It's also used to create associations for the guest via theming and make important stuff stand out. Note in the Paris chapter how Dimitri's boat looks an awful lot like the nightclub sign, or how the Contessa's house projects a Black Widow symbol. It is possible, of course, to find where you want to go with the new Inocucom, now your all-purpose tutorial, camera, and wayfinder tool that can put you back on the right path. But it doesn't diminish the appreciation of the way a stage will naturally guide you to important spots. Chapter 6 is a strong example of how things have been streamlined. The level is divided into specific quadrants. At the bottom is the gang's warehouse, out on the dock facing the base of operations, the station village. Jean Besson's cabin surrounds this area on the hills to oversee work, so there's a relationship that stretches across the map and makes space feel necessary to traverse. The expanse in the centre is broken up by the train lines, which intersect the major landmarks, and by a separate section on the right occupied by a special guest. Last is the satellite mountain that hides a bear cave underneath, just to give this 
central area and the lower section some interesting character dynamics. The landmarks act as associative shorthand for environments being bigger or livelier than they actually are. The station centre and wilderness are tiny, but it gives off the impression of being a substantial area through the suggestion of detail. Character design also acts as associative shorthand. Looking at the main cast, designed by Dev Medan, the process in creating them builds on the strength of the original game, varying nicely against each other in colours, shapes and size. It's a little richer than the last title, boss characters sporting sharp spots of reds and purples, compared to our hero's simpler, softer, encompassing palettes, getting that rich and poor vibe out there in front. The lesser enemies are not as striking in colour and size to accommodate the difference, and worry more about communicating different levels of threat and interactivity. It was explained, for example, that something like the aggressive wild bear is stylized differently to the henchman. The Canadian goose worker, deliberately designed to look ineffective and cartoony, is clearly a… person. The bear, on the other hand, is more removed from caricatured human traits with its smaller, sharper facial features and an emphasis on form over expressiveness, placing it firmly in the realm of creature and heightening the sense of danger. This kind of disparity is well placed over the game. Makes you feel less weird about animal characters being around just uh, animals. I don't know what to say or do about this though. The visual implication of stealing a severed moose head to blend in with this guard? It's a bit out of my critical range. There is also the inclusion of the escaped Carmelita, who now walks around the map. She strides, unlike the guards, with real purpose, and will even fight with any that get in her way. It's great to see her on the job inside of the level, communicating that you're pinched between a couple of factors in the same way the roaming tanks did in the previous level, placing you squarely in the centre of this delicate ecosystem. Such touches further the cause of interactive storytelling, seeing the consequences of prior events in real time. Her actions, after so long, impress definitively her purpose as a force of great good, that her belief in the law, even while running from it, is genuine. It's inconvenient that she's Nab Murray, sure, but you gotta give her points for trying. Hey criminal, you doing okay in there? I'm okay. And thanks for that bag of jelly beans, I was starving. This is the kind of demonstrative interactivity Nate Fox was talking about earlier. Worth mentioning that his background in theatre, stemming from his college days, and likely shared by Brian Oberg, provided a great basis for his ability to coordinate those dramatic beats inside of this interactive space. Whenever anybody asks me, like, what's the best preparation for going into game design, that was I would say theatre of uh, collaborative, you know, creative work where if I suck, then Kevin, you really got to help me be get better because I'm going to drag right. the whole show down. And you have to learn how to put together sets and you never have enough money to build what you really want. <laughs> oh, so you have to be kind of canny yeah. <laughs> and you have to do your own lighting and you think about everything from the audience's perspective. Huh. So it's just this is really this is lining up yeah. pretty well. <laughs> the level has quite a few moments of interactivity like Carmelita's appearance. Previous levels didn't. One of my favorite details like this is that when you encounter Basson early on, you can figure out the plan before you reach the end of the game. When Sly enters his cabin, you can choose to listen to his and the mysterious arpeggios conversation in full if you find a good hiding spot instead of zipping in and out for the mission. By the way, you ready to giddy up into Perry for the final hoedown? Yes! It's not to say that things don't slow down, perhaps. The missions are a little more relaxed, and maybe Basson is not as interesting as the Contessa to hold two full stages alone. Which, in the way it's portrayed, is kind of the point. Much like China in the previous game, this works as a cooldown section after the intensity of both Prague stages. It tries to break up the action from being based mostly in the hub world too. The first level focuses on train heists out of town, which are a great test of your sneaking abilities, as well as where Neela sits in the story. This cooldown section also keeps the emotional arc of the plot in flux. The gang ends this level on a real high point, having outsmarted the supposedly stupidest member of the Claw Gang and earning the biggest reward. We we're walking away with three, count them, three clockwork parts. That's real clever, because the chapter that follows undercuts it all, and more besides. If you're suddenly feeling off balance, it's probably by design. The action moves to an isolated coastal setting, the ghostly northern lights above you, a calm before the storm as you realise that things might not be going as well as you thought. This is especially apparent when you turn to extremely desperate tactics during the following missions, culminating in pitiful plans concocted on the spur of the moment during the final operation, participating in Jean Besson's rigged lumberjack games. If you're throwing the operation out the window, it can't end well. You aren't the judges I hired. Yes, it's the slowest, oddest villain who actually undoes all of your hard work in the game so far, bringing us from the game's highest high to its lowest low. Arpeggio is willing to plunk down a king's ransom for the whole lot. I even threw in the talons. You sold all the clockwork parts? 
Arpeggio has them all? It carries on that trend of sabotaging the gang's good fortune, the player feeling the burn of thievery's always perilous odds. It also turns out he's a racist, just to add insult to injury. I wouldn't expect one of your kind to understand the finer points of commerce. You turtles are too stupid to know a woodcutter from a woodchuck. Bold move, SP. Woke as fuck. The boss that follows is an excellent confrontation, maybe emphasized by how other bosses in this game don't quite hit the same mark. It's difficult to rag on because the bosses have changed to accommodate the new game structure, deliberately avoiding tropes better suited to other gameplay styles and instead just opting for endurance brawls. They serve the story well enough with a couple of neat contextual differences, Murray getting to be the one who takes on Rajan to throw the player off balance during the big twist, making the most of both figures. It's like a visual payoff in that both are big fighters in a pseudo boxing ring, and there's a little character arc between the lines, with Murray finally getting a chance to shine. Who's the Murray? All I see is a fat, Pathetic weekly. I might be big and not as smart as the other guys, but one thing I'm not is weak. Kinda draw Rajan going off on Murray's name, given the guy crowned himself Lord of the Hills, you feel me? This one with Basson is the crown jewel though, really using what we know about the characters to convey a unique challenge, spiritually following up on the Prague chapter to prove your worth. Tiny Bentley calls on his teammates above to activate parts of the sawmill, as well as his sense of self-preservation to overcome a larger, rougher bad guy. How's that? Classic David and Goliath stuff, appropriately letting characters instruct the gameplay for a different and emotionally satisfying experience. It doesn't change that you're out of luck, and is of course where things get tonally and deliberately very weird. I think it's obvious by now that the writing has taken a quantum leap inside of those cutscenes, in 2D form as well as in the in-game movies. They no longer stick rigidly to the original's formula of a villain introduction followed by a victory, instead playing off the character's feelings towards the situation to go off book and just emote. The third to last cutscene, with the characters having lost everything, runs right on with that. I knew we all felt it. Failure. I was twitchy and ready for action. Any action. Bentley tried to make some sense of the situation by drawing up meaningless plans. But Murray? Murray took it the worst. He just sat there, sobbing, while the team van floated away over the horizon. That van was his life. Yeah, I know it's just a stupid van. I'm not crying, okay? Having the heroes admit defeat in this kind of game just demands your attention. C can you imagine this thought process playing out in what, like, Sonic Adventure 2 or something? What? The hatch doors don't are open. sweat it, Knuckles. The only thing in the cargo bay are those master emeralds. What do you mean, emeralds. don't sweat it? Right? Land the Knock shuttle it and off, let Knuckles. me out. We're gonna crash this thing if you keep that up. Oh no! Don't touch that lever! <laughs> Yikes. I should, before we wrap up, elaborate as I did last time on the game's overall aesthetic. Is real good. Presentation across the board is much more theatrical, even the menus participate. Before, you just selected the world you wanted from the van, progress shown by the loot you amassed from each world like you were a wandering bunch of vagabonds. Now it's all done from an episode select menu, featuring a couple of cutscene bumper images. Sells the animated series packaging well, a clear goal for the developers since the beginning. Style is king here. Even the title cards feel less generic looking than before, vibing off of what happens in the level story. The three act structure subtly present in the tutorial is properly signposted in each stage to give it, if not the runtime, then the flow of a standalone episode. We want people to feel like they are not playing through levels as much as experiencing different episodes in the universe of Sly Cooper and his gang. Sets of missions are intercut with Bentley's briefings to mark each act, the final set always being presented as an operation to collect the next clockwork part. Once again, this is supported by the bumper 2D cutscenes that mark the clear start and end of these chapters. The approach to these movies has improved greatly. The originals were fine, but were abrasively polished, with characters and backgrounds clashing, as well as being undecided in the kind of movement they wanted to implement. Neither full animation nor simple moving parts. There's no mistaking the approach this time, we've doubled down on comic books. If anything moves, it's often single pieces of a drawing to give the impression of a still image being manipulated rather than an unfinished animation. The scenes now use a ton of comic book motifs, like separate panels or stylized action lines. Comic book sound effect balloons even exist inside of the game world, with a little Adam West audio sting to signal that you've downed an enemy. Best of all is the graphic pop of the drawing style. A good way to show off the change is by way of a rough draft of the Dimitri cutscene crafted for an E3 demo. A shady underworld celebrity has straddled the worlds of both high-class art and low-life nightclub. 
He's rumored to run a private club that caters to the odd and thrill seekers alike, concealed somewhere deep below the five-star theater for me dub. The dummy version uses many of the methods of the original stylization, more like collage cutouts than graphic drawings. Has real panache as still images, but it's uh, kinda messy to look at in motion. The final version sells the newfound sophistication of the story much better. Dimitri now runs a nightclub on the west side. The thumping music, colorful light shows, and a hint of danger lure in chic young patrons from far and wide. Dev Medan still led visual development, but a team was needed to help refine the style as his workload across the game increased. Enter the Kotzebue brothers, Travis and Jordan. They had worked on the previous game, but now were responsible for the final passes on cutscenes, Dev having opted for bold, slicker outlines, closer to the actual techniques of mainstream comics. Travis and Dev contributed pencil drawings that were cleaned up by Jordan, with backgrounds painted by Kathy Anderson. Now the characters demand attention through bold, graphic outlines and bright colours, while Kathy's backgrounds take on a less contrasting linelessness to soften their focus focus, as well as having calmer, earthier palettes. Makes the characters pop and read quicker, sometimes assisted with an extra highlight border like some kind of faux rim lighting, which ends up having a bit of a sticker effect, Paper Mario style. It ensures that you see this as purely illustrative. They're meant to be simplified depictions of events rather than fully animated cartoons to resolutely differentiate them from the base game. It's a challenge to try and pick up on which drawings are Dev's and which are Travis's. Dev's drawings seem to have more pinched features, whereas Travis's tend to bulk out. Ditko versus Romita, perhaps? I, I, nobody's gonna get that, cut that out. <laughs> Travis Kotzebue, incidentally, was an environment artist, and provided a great deal of layouts for the 3D modelers to take on. His angular work features shapes that are squeezed from one end or tapered out, part of the funkified design theory they'd settled on, which dictates that there must be no 90 degree angles in creating architecture and objects. Gives the whole thing this whacked out, energized twist. They're also much more considerate in their staging. Prior levels had to dress up the walls of long corridors that went all in on detail in these enclosed spaces. Free roaming cameras meant the weenies we mentioned earlier needed to draw the most focus, so Nate Fox would block out the stage first and then hand it over to people like Suzanne Kaufman and Paul Whitehead to apply the architecture on top of those shapes. The layouts are consequently already a little well-composed painting before the detail is applied. Everything can be broken down into a simple circle with gravitational points that pull everything towards them, which makes it easier to grasp as a work of art as much as a coherent map. For us, the environments we really wanted to make them beautiful and interesting, but never more important than Sly. Not just artistically, but also game-wise, they should be fun to play in. Very jungle gym. They should feel very stealthy. You should feel when you're playing in these worlds, I can't believe I'm getting to do this. When Chris Zimmerman remade the engine, it gave the artists a chance to better incorporate some design theories planned for the original, specifically to make the game look more like a living cartoon. Models are far less internally complex, freeing up loads of space for texture and lighting improvements. Karen Yamagiwa was another core artist who provided some texture work, and explained how they could be used to portray a level's mood as well as signify the important areas of interactivity through different levels of detail. This follows on, according to Dev, from an old cartoon theory. You knew what objects in the background of an image were going to move on a separate cell because they were painted with less detail and harsh outlines, much like the character models. The closer something is to the foreground, the more graphic and abstract, so it pops against the background details. Improved cell shading adds to this effect by wrapping light around character models and highlighting them against the rest of the background to give them the appearance of flat animation cells. Underneath all of this, Music has also, of course, taken a huge leap forward. I didn't mention... I'm probably gonna bugger this name, Ashif Hakik's work previously, not because it was bad. Hakik's work had an understated junkyard vibe to it, mostly a reflection of the rougher villains and locations it accompanied, but it wasn't going to lift the material further for the sequel. Instead, we have video game veteran Peter McConnell, a composer who brought us work for a huge amount of old LucasArts adventure games and their alumni. He'd trodden jazzy, sophisticated ground before in the half-golden age Hollywood tribute Grim Fandango. That talent was a perfect fit for the reorientation of Sly's style on the sequel. Sly even has a defining string of notes that mark his theme now, one section played rather deliberately on the bass line. It's something you can weave leitmotifs off into the other tracks, as if Sly is hiding musically inside of the scene.
Having everything stylistically fit together like a puzzle box just goes to show the care Sucker Punch took on Sly 2 as a whole. There was an element of verisimilitude to the original, interaction with objects or giving purposes to ideas that felt logical inside and outside of a video game, health pickups interpreted as lucky horseshoes, being able to see visual cues to sneak on stuff, labelled as a kind of innate thief vision, but it still felt like it was being squeezed into a series of expected platformer constrictions. Here the medium has been taken by the horns and tamed into catering to the world and characters first. The way you interact with everything bounces off of real-world logic, and the art style marries this with clarity of design and visual metaphors. Everything contributes in one way or another to making this world seem credible, giving it a domestication of disbelief so you're never pulled out of the story being told, and even when something utterly ridiculous takes place, often those jokes are still a part of the world we've been made aware of. Maybe with some exceptions, depending on your point of view. Like I said, giant attack! Robot. The final level's villain, Arpeggio, is a neat product of this work, his desire to fly clearly referencing the real-life studies of artist Leonardo da Vinci as both a tongue-in-cheek joke and a serious motivation. Serious enough that the final act of the game departs from what we may have expected from its design to change the lives of everyone involved. <laughs> I'm sort of at a disadvantage here in describing the impact of Sly 2's ending. Dramatically, it was easier to set up the ending of the previous game because the introduction of Clockwork was such a shock. When it comes to Sly 2, it's more of a gradual, hollow feeling, an air of bittersweetness that's more consistent with what's happened in the game so far than the previous one, and that may be hard for me to accurately capture. World 8 feels… real purple. I mean that. Everything has gone wrong. You're in a tenuous location. You're out of time. This is reflected in the constant twilight above you. The sun is coming down on your adventure. You can't let that happen. There's also the helplessness of being on a helicarrier miles above the earth that uh, doesn't exactly instill great confidence. The level doesn't stop gut-punching you either. The first mission there to show you that clockwork has actually been assembled, and it's kind of your fault. In your mad desperation, evident from the first cutscene to stop this from happening, you've just made it way easier for someone who really needed to let it happen. It's not explicitly spoken, but I think there is an element of Sly being personally undermined here in a way we're not used to seeing. That comes in the form of what is both a brilliant and frankly bonkers denouement that goes on for a long time. Immortality! Immortality is what I seek! When fully powered up, I'll join myself to its circuit and be born. Putting its tears and wires together was child's play, compared with the use of both half a mind and susceptible to people through the use of flashing lights. Thank goodness for Dimitri! You're going to Paris to unleash a hypnotic light show of hate. That's outlandishly cruel. That, that's all you needed to know, really. So, Arpeggio lives out his dream and. Oh. Stupid Arpeggio. I double-crossed the Koopa guy, Interpol, and Carmelita. What made you think I wouldn't do the same to you? I'd like to stop things for a second and address the tiger in the room. Neela. Maybe my only major criticism. For years, I thought there was something interesting about the portrayal of Neela as a British Indian tigress, and, given the existence of Rajan, almost too coincidental from a design perspective. I also assumed I was just overthinking it. Turns out, it wasn't too far from the truth. Neela was intended to be the daughter of Rajan, but allegedly her involvement in this role became too complicated and was streamlined to her being another officer hot on Sly's heels. Now, again, I don't know the full story here. I don't know if she was ever meant to be part of her father's gang, though I imagine she probably remained a rival love interest for Sly during the India chapter. Thing is, it feels like the adjustment may have taken a toll on her character. For starters, given the small cast, the visual connection is still distracting, especially when the manual mentions her growing up in New Delhi. Uh, would have been nice to see that trigger at least some kind of dialogue. Neil is a fab bad guy theoretically, but in practice leaves a lot to be desired. It's great that she goes from the morally playful, well-spoken officer of the first few chapters to a crazy cockney dame, but seeing the game has been so good at suspending our disbelief this far, there are elements that maybe seem unbelievable mostly her utter batshit insanity before the final twist, which makes her come across as less crafty and more… irritating. Most of it is probably down to my lack of conviction in her vocal performance. You won't stop me! Not the Cooper gang! Not Interpol! Not anyone! Oh, oh, bravo! So authentic it makes Judy Dench sound like bloody Daphne Moon! As it stands, it does the job fine. 
I don't think anyone saw her ties to the Claw Gang coming, what with the way she's treated them throughout the whole affair, and there is something quite worrying about someone as competent as Sly being so consistently insane. I think the idea is that she's just impatient, maybe something Sly should have picked up on when a police officer started talking to him about bending the law in the first place. She's entertaining for who she is, and I don't think that takes away from this moment at all. I demand you exit the clockwork frame or... or... It's very effective, except maybe uh, for the choice of name she came up with for her new form. Heracla is born! Yeah, not great. There's an attempt in the final chapter to touch on all of the stuff we've discussed earlier and cap off on those ideas. Clockler patrols the base constantly from now on, making her presence known even more than previous foes. Teamwork gets a lovely send-off in the structure of the assignments. Missions call on one member of the gang to open an area through their special skills, only to really call upon someone else to finish the job. We even get a little goodbye mission for the barrel mechanic, used only a few times across the two titles, having peaked at being armed with bombs, and this being the last time we see it take center stage in the series. A moment of silence for, uh, that. Tears for souvenirs are all you left me. Alright, that's enough. Don't miss it that much, blew me up all the fucking time. In the end, Carmelita comes to the rescue, echoing the final moments of the original game. Cut the flirty chit chat and get down to business. I need an experienced tail gunner. Jump in and grab the gun. We've got a bird to take down. That's not flirty chit-chat. It's nice that there's throwbacks to the first fight with Clockwork, though at this point it feels slightly anticlimactic. We're maybe in danger of losing the tension we were building there. There must be some way to get it back. Clockla's looking mighty upset, and I think she's going to take it out on us. I'm coming, guys. Hold on. This whole ending is so dreamlike, almost a reflection of Sly's disbelief it would ever get this far. Your friends are just sailing out into the void as you push against the current to reach clockwork. I, I mean, Neela, right? You're still the low-down, backstabbing coward we've beaten time and time again. I might not have been more talented than you but I feel something, some power growing within me. Yeah, we're, uh, we're not talking to Neela anymore. The creature comes down in Paris. We've come full circle. We... we did it! Right on! It's an emotional moment! Die, insects! Die! The sky remains tinged with purple to show we're not done yet, and the events that follow continue to feel unplanned and not very lucid. It's still not a particularly climactic confrontation, though it does lead to climactic results. Ah! My glasses! What? Bentley! I'll save you! Pick me up! I can't walk! Come on, Sly, let's get out of here! That's the image we're left on as the game winds down, before coming abruptly back to reality. Carmelita cursed herself for showing up too late to get a few shots in on Clockla. So she took it out on what was close at hand. The hate chip. And just like that, it was over. Without that core piece, that essential center of clockwork, there was nothing left. It might seem stupid, but I think the hate chip MacGuffin exists purely so that, once again, it can be Carmelita who puts Sly's life back on track, and still keep the ending we just had. How ironic that Carmelita, a police officer, would be the one to lift the curse from the Cooper family. The menace of clockwork would never again rise to threaten me or my children. Unfortunately, this has come at a great cost. Sly's gang. They'd taken some bruises through all of this, but I was surprised, shocked really, to see them leave their gear behind as they walked away. Their wounds were deeper than I'd imagined. Those guys were hurting. It's why turning himself in is the perfect penance for those flaws raised earlier, a recognition that he is culpable for their pain, completing his arc. We're on uncharted ground with Sly and Carmelita's custody, so he falls back on another thing he does well. Flirt. As the reality of my capture started to sink in, she began to relax. We spoke freely about our previous adventures, comparing notes and even getting in a few laughs. Then we started talking about, well, everything. This is an unexpected pleasure, just seeing two people be real with us in these final moments. It was like we were on a first date. She even showed me the bottle she'd been saving for the special occasion of my arrest. Their retelling this only happens on her terms, or so we thought.
She went forward to ask the pilot what was up, and it looked like my pals had left me a little going away present before taking off. Floating away on the night breeze, I could faintly make out Carmelita's voice. I'll find you, Cooper! I genuinely thought there'd be no sequel, because this ending is perfect. I'll be seeing you soon, Green Tail. Top that, uh, Kojima? Yeah, <laughs> oh dear. You gotta love this epilogue. Little where are they now outros, like they're Frank Abagnale or something. <laughs> look, everybody's fine, it's all good, look, he's got rugs. Holy shit, how is this video an hour? Whew, uh, that was a lot. Sorry. It's mostly because Sly 2 can't be talked about in the same way as the first. That game was about creating the framework of a great idea, and all the things it did right are still honoured in the sequel. What they've done to improve on it is to overlap the existing good qualities, and to have them talk to each other. The in-house teamwork was stronger, the in-game teamwork was stronger, character and level-based interactions completely recontextualize the gameplay, even the thematic content of the original is boosted by the inclusion of these aspects. Reputation is, of course, the backbone of the adventure from start to finish. We have the same basics at play. Locations based on real places, our knowledge of real animals to suggest character types, Sly's attempt to forge his own chapter in his family legacy, yada yada. That stuff is also overturned quite often. Environments are, this time, not what they seem. A nightclub is actually a spice den. An ancestral home is just for show. The Northern Lights are part of a bizarre evil scheme. The comic book serial nature of the presentation suggests that these are ongoing adventures of well-known characters. The impression that they could go on for as long as they wanted, even though, of course, they do not. Clockwork Shadow looms large right from the opening cutscenes. Sly's desperation to destroy him actually setting up his comeback. We see people's ranks get inverted at every turn. Both Neela and the Contessa using Interpol to front their schemes, or Carmelita having to clear her name while running as a criminal herself. We see the thieves even come up against their greatest fear, which lives up to everything they expected. Sly's legacy is safe, but now his future is also taken care of, and by the person he least expected. Benchley and Murray took a stand at the last hurdle and faced the difficult reality of their job. Even Jean Besson getting beat for his speciesism, I'm not kidding, is a vital part of that thematic content. This sequel gives everything depth. We confront the status quo and put the characters in uncomfortable places, things the player grapples with too. The highs and lows of the game's emotional content echoes through the design choices and presents a narrative that feels like it really matters, exactly as you'd hope a sequel would. In the original, Sly started out as an underdog and came out swinging against the odds. Here, his luck finally runs out. Sly's rep wasn't enough to keep him out of trouble, to keep his friends safe. There was always someone more devious ready to outsmart them, someone a step ahead in what is essentially a profession full of bad people. We thought we were invincible, even managing to escape the impossible, but it doesn't matter who you are. The final stage tells us that, truly, nothing lasts forever. Sly 2 shows us that actions have consequences, and I think this is why people connect with it the most of the trilogy. Its ability to create empathy. Sucker Punch wanted you to feel like a thief, and you feel it now, more than ever. You feel the thrill of getting away with the impossible, of ripping off the rich and laughing in the face of the cops. You also feel the strain of that dangerous lifestyle, how it can hurt your friends, how it can hurt yourself. They may be outside the law, free to do as they want, but they're also trapped by that same ideal, the greater freedoms coming with greater consequences. All these guys had were each other. Something Sly unwittingly sacrificed in his single-minded journey, only he's right back where he started. And so are we. What he does finish with is the same thing the player gets. A closer connection with a group of individuals, and a better understanding of the value they brought with them. That band of thieves. Maybe that's all we needed, or will ever need, for this adventure to matter. There was no party at the end, no trophy, no handshake. But what did you expect? You've seen everything. You won. Go outside. But it doesn't end there. What, you think you tell a story like this without paying off the inevitable? No, no, no. We're not done yet. Something has to give, and something indeed does. Sly 3 is, as a result, the definitive ending for the series. And that is, of course, a story for next time. And we're done. That was long. I have a ridiculous amount of wonderful people I have to thank for making this possible, and a lot of them are going to be in the description, so please check that out to ensure these wonderful people are paid due cause. 
First of all, thank you so much to all of my patrons. You guys have stuck by through a, a very difficult period of video making, so thank you so much for supporting this to the point that it's finally come to. I really hope this video does all of you guys justice. Also a shout out to my Discord, who've helped add a couple points to this video, that was incredibly generous of you guys. Next is Cloud Cuckoo Country for helping get the script into shape, and it's highly recommended you check out his work if you haven't already. The Sly Cooper Wiki Discord was a massive help in discovering information I didn't otherwise know about, and deserves plenty of support if you're a fan. Jordan Kotzebue himself was kind enough to answer a few questions I had concerning the development of the cutscenes. He's got a ton of projects across social media, and it'd be really cool if you could check those out. Final thanks goes to my amazing voice actors, Corgi Sword and Shannon Hobby, helping provide some vocal colour to a bit of sly history. Please check out their links below, see the other stuff they've done, they are really good people. My deepest thanks to every last one of you. We're, st we're still not dead just yet. Feel free to check out my other work if you like, or help support my Patreon if you want to see more of this weird stuff. I will do some different videos again before getting back into Sly 3, so watch this space. Uh, not forever, of course, because you will go blind. We'll dance through Bollywood and eat curry all night long. No, Sly, don't do it. You won't sleep for shits.